Hello, thank you so much for joining us at the 43rd Mill Valley Film Festival. My name is Farida Badamosi and you've just watched the absolutely stunning Lapsus. And we have a treat for you. I'm so excited to introduce the writer director Noah Hutton to speak to us about that absolutely great film, especially that ending shot um, kind of just stays with you for a really long time and freaks you out. Um, so uh, the first thing I wanted to ask of course is like, what inspired the film? I understand there's clearly influences in our current society, a parallel present, essentially. Um, but wanted to know, why did you decide to make a film about this particular topic? Yeah, I guess I wanted to make a film that could could shine light on stuff in our world from that that kind of alternate present perspective. The, the, my favorite kind of sci-fi, I guess, is, you know, that which doesn't seem too far-fetched, but actually says something about our world today. So kind of, I guess people call that grounded sci-fi, but whatever you want to call it. The, the, the particular inspiration though for this film came from actually an essay by a, an artist, an academic named Patricia Reed. And the essay is called Logic and Fiction, if anyone wants to look it up. But basically the, the short of it is, it's an essay just showing how the our economic system, especially in what we saw in 2008 and again now with these big collapses and when things sh suddenly shift and there's a new boom or a bust, it just shows you how uh, kind of abstract the fiction we, we take for granted is about the way the world works with, you know, derivatives and high speed trading and the way Wall Street, the, the sort of like logic of Wall Street. We just sort of accept these as ground truths of the way the economy works, but it's highly absurdist fiction, actually, that's been, we've all been written into. So I, I like the idea of kind of inventing a world that had absurdist elements that kind of are just the ground truth of, of how this world works, because I think that is actually how I see our world today. It seems so rational and logical, but you poke it like, like Django, one block falls out and the whole thing could, could topple over. So that kind of was the like pregnant space for for creating the world and like the rules of the world. Well, speaking of the rules of the world, they feel very intricate. Um, the first time when we were describing the film, I was like describing the details to someone and they were like, okay. And I was like, you just have to watch the film. Um, so I wanted to know like what went into like getting those minute details because it made the world feel very, very real. And like, I applaud that. Like I felt like I was literally in that space and I understood it. So I wanted to know how did you craft those individual, those details for the story, like Omnia and like the actual cabling process. Yeah, they all, well, the, the, the like seed of each of those ideas comes from an observation about our world. You know, the gamification of labor was certainly a big inspiration, you know, reading things about how Amazon warehouses, you know, ask you to wear some sort of bracelet that monitors, you know, your speed around the floor and um, you know, in terms of omnia and the sickness that's sort of plaguing like young young men in this world, um, you know, there's a like, there's a sort of resonance now to what's going on today that was not intended in a, in a certain way of like people who are staying home and and unable to really like go out into society and everyone's sort of becoming cloistered, um, a withdrawal of you know from from the world. But in at at the moment, you know, it was just sort of like we live in a world where there are so many little subcultures that each have their like truths. And we don't even know if this disease is necessarily real or not, but it, for the people who have it, it is real. So, um, you know, and, and anyway, but to answer your question, like every time one idea would happen, you then have to like weave it into the fabric of the film. So you have to like figure out, well, what, well, if, if they're, you know, out in the forest and they have to pull cable, how do they get more cable? Well, we got to have a drone you know, drop a bundle, like we, we got to have resupply of for the carts, they have to go through this little machine and get a new bundle in and keep moving. So it was actually a really fun process of like, embedding each of these little ideas inside the, the, wor the world of the film. And then uh, another thing that I really enjoyed was like, the cast. Um, so like, I wanted to know what went into the casting process, just because like, there was lots of recognizable faces for me, because I watch a lot of stuff. But it was also like, everyone was so, no character felt like an afterthought. I felt like every character really was important for the moment they're on screen. So I wanted to know what went into, and a lot of that is like casting and also directing. So I just wanted to know like what went into uh, finding your actors for the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm glad you recognize a bunch of them. That's great. <laughs> I think they're all great. And I wish they were all, you know, more, better known, but I wrote this film really for 
Dean Imperial, who hadn't been in anything. I'm sure you didn't recognize yeah. him. I didn't he, recognize him <laughs> <laughs> afterwards. I was like, I don't think I know him. <laughs> cool, now I want yeah. to. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's only been in one short film, and I hadn't even seen him. And I, I had seen him in a reading at Naked Angels, this like playwright group in New York. And I, you know, I, I so it started with Dean, and it was kind of he was like my muse, my like New Yorker muse for this for this story, and like doing blue collar sci fi. He like he really felt right for that. And then you know, I love Madeline Wise. Uh, I, I had I had met her a couple times. I always wanted to you know work with her somehow, and and so her kind of like flat sort of acerbic quality is what is felt right to me to be opposite him and those are two sort of like forces in the world I wanted to bring together and um and then every, you know everyone else like it really just filled out so well we, we we worked with an amazing casting director Erica Hart who's here in New York and she she like brought us a lot of these ideas so I, I you know hats off to her and everyone just stepped into it so well. I think some people were like, what the hell, what is this movie I'm in? Like I, there were some, there were, like we, I, I certainly encountered some, some of the like supporting actors being like, I, I have read my part. I don't really understand like what this, I think it was harder on the page to imagine what this like world would look like, you know? And you know, and even when you're making the movie, you look around and I, I don't even know if some people really, anyway, you know, f realize how they would fit in or whatever. But we, everyone we showed it to now, is just so pumped and I think gets re-excited by seeing themselves in it. Um, and then in terms of shooting, did you actually sh shoot in New York? Um, yeah, we shot, we shot um, upstate New York on, in, in, on some like state park land and also some private land forests, um, like about an hour and a half north of the city. Uh, and then I guess this is just like a random question. The cube, what went into creating the giant, was it actually magnetized? How'd you get things to stick to it? I don't know. Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking about that because the, we didn't have enough money to actually make a whole cube. So there, we only ever had two sides of the cube that we could cover with steel plates. So every shot we'd have to, like if we were turning the camera around to like cover the other side of a scene, we'd have to just like twist the cube. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, you know, but that, those are the kind of the fun constraints of like, you know, indie filmmaking. And we did, we got like magnetized steel plates. It was, they were expensive. So we couldn't, we we had like steel plates and then these little like magnets that were in the heads of the cables and they actually did make that like they actually did pull it and you know we added some we added some sound design after the fact to make it a little more dramatic I'll, I'll admit <laughs> but yeah it was a, it was a wood frame it was just like a, a plywood frame and then we had like steel plating uh, the other thing that I was interested like thought was really cool design wise was the actual machines because they don't seem nefarious until you just see them watching them consistently because they seem like kind of like the cute little things that you see always online of them look at them doing flips and then you yeah. see that last one just making its way back and it kind of just like stalks you so i wanted to know what went into the design of those little creepers i guess <laughs> yeah I, I uh those are those were existing robots from a lab at upenn that had designed them in the late 90s i believe and they'd been sitting around because this is like the same lab that designed a lot of the robots for boston dynamics which is like many people probably know that company and other their robots go viral a lot and they look like dogs and humans or whatever and so this one was like one of their earlier ones that looks kind of like an insect of some kind but doesn't you know didn't really make it and so but i was looking deep in their archives and i found this one and i thought this is fits the kind of like almost 90s tech that we have going on in this world. And so we got the lab to make it an academic project and they sent like three or four students to our set. And so we didn't pay anything for the robots. We didn't design them, we didn't build them. They brought two of them and the students controlled them with little controllers right off screen. And they, they got like academic credit for it. And so that was just like a huge coup for us. Cause again, we didn't have the budget to like design robots from scratch for sure. So, you know, that, uh, like, the UPenn connection became the way we were able to, like, make the robot thing happen. That's pretty cool. You guys my alma mater, so I, I like... Oh, really? Oh! Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's pretty cool. Uh, my next question is, um, in terms of, like, lapsus in the film, we, we essentially meet a lapsus or John um, by the end of the film. Are we meant to 
believe him when he says that he doesn't recognize Madeline Wise's character? Um, well, I don't want to tell people what to think necessarily, but okay. but I, I I will. I mean, I'll say like my intention there was to was to actually give him a little sympathetic turn that he's actually protecting his daughter um, by saying he doesn't recognize her. That's great. Cool. I, that's what I assumed, but I was like, maybe it's even deeper. <laughs> <laughs> maybe she's not actually his daughter. I don't know. My I, I want to allow for that. They have to allow for those, <laughs> those other layers. I was like, maybe there's <laughs> more to it. And she's yeah. like, coming. Um, <laughs> so that's really cool. Awesome. Um, and then I guess imagining a future because there is one that's still not offline. What do you think happens? Because we do see labor movements in our current day kind of rise and fall. So do you think that they, for you, for these characters, do you think that it actually works out for them? Um, and then my second question is, well, I guess I'll do this after this question. Sure. Well, I, I, the, this, actual, this actual group, um, I'm not sure that it will work out for them until they get the suburban family on their side. And I think that, to me, that's what I see a, a, a larger you know, theme in society is that pockets of, so, uh, you know, isolated pockets of, of social movements will require those kind of like safe families to, to, to pick a side and not to, you know, break the picket line um, by buying products or support or whatever, whatever it is, you know, the, whatever the boycott or strike entails. In this case, it's like, you know, the, the family denies Ray charging his phone, like a basic human act of goodwill. And then, and then probably is getting money by char to charge the robot at the very end. So that's just like a little bit of a of pointing the finger, I think, at the the safe middle, upper middle class family and saying like it actually will take that th that force in society to to transform society to choose which side they're on. And then one thing that I was struck by was the face, I guess, of the the one who changes the labor movement and like uh, defy like the blue collar worker, what that actually looks like, especially in that space. And I also really enjoyed the conversation she had about like um, privilege, essentially. Like he got this name, got the really great rights. So I, I wanted to like unpack some of the themes that you were going for in the film. Yeah, no, I appreciate you, you um, picking up on that. Cause that was, that was something I was definitely going for was the fact that this guy, you know, this, this white worker got a head, you know, got a, someone else's, it wasn't even his identity, so he didn't feel like it was even his problem. But yes, he got a head start, and that's a, I think that's a larger metaphor for, you know, <laughs> for for what happens with people at large in this world. Um, people get head starts, right? And like, so I, you know, I got a head start, and I was just trying to figure out a way to to get those two viewpoints in conversation. At, at one point, on, on one hand, you have Ray, who's like the rugged. American individualist who's like, no, we all work hard. We all, you know, I'd work just as hard as you. What do you mean? I, you know, and the, but he actually, even by no doing of his own, he got a head start. Right? Like he, he inherited this. So he was, he was born into it, whatever you want to say. So, you know, that, like that conversation for me is key that he has with Anna, where she calls him out for that and he, and he gets pissed off, you know, but I, I, I did want to be hopeful that someone like that could come around to seeing you know, how they could actually use that head start to help the movement as a whole. And that's what he ends up doing. Um, after some, you know, pushing and pulling, he ends up lending that identity, which is like crucial for this movement, um, just because of the specificity of, the, of what the movie's about. But, uh, but in general, that's the point is like, how could that head start be leveraged for something, you know, that could help more people than just yourself? Uh, the... I really, one thing I really enjoyed, I mentioned it before, but it's like the specificity of the world. Um, so not just like the cabling technology, but like renting, uh, like even renting a garage to store your stuff without actually communicating with a person. Or like, uh, I guess the quant, well, I guess I want to talk a little bit more about like the quanta, the quanta computer system and like mm -hmm. the varying, uh, like the police saying that only on this website on this particular computer works in order for you to know the calendar. So that a I thought it was like hilarious, and then he still got a ticket, and I was like, oh my god, that's a magic cop. How did you? Get that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was. I really enjoyed those moments because it wasn't simply 
the gig economy elements of the society that were inherently flawed. It was other like unevenness. So like what were like what were other like points that you were trying to engage with, like with the world in general, not just in like the cabling world? Yeah, I think I think what you're picking up on is a larger critique, not just of the gig economy, but of um, the the overhype and sort of like a way in which we set our, our hopes on technology to as a panacea of a great panacea. And I think we've seen in the last couple of decades since like the dot com boom and, and Silicon, the rise of Silicon Valley that, you know, there's been such a fallout now in the way in which tech has not transformed our world for good. It's been a lot of interesting and cool things that have come out of it for sure. But every time there's a new way in which the world's going to be brought together closer, closer together, or, you know, divisions are going to be sown by through tech. Um, it, some people at the top profit and most working people wake up one day and like get a parking ticket because of weird new tech. <laughs> That's sort of like my take on it. You know, it's like, I, and, and I was also thinking of like, the beginning of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where our, our hero kind of wakes up and like there's a bulldozer in his front, you know, and like he's he's been overtaken by the world around him. So that little bit of like um, of a Lud of a Luddite like uh, encountering new tech, it's not it is not necessarily that like you know technology is bad and everything. It, it, if if profits were shared shared properly from this automated technology in the world of lapsus, I think it could help all these workers. They could have protections. It's not necessarily that the robots are evil, but um, unfortunately the way our world is set up, it's usually with new technology, uh, we see an amplification of existing inequality. Cool. I also really like the LM MLM element of like getting signed up for to be a cabler. I thought that was really fun. As well, I was like, "Oh, I've met you before." <laughs> trying to sell me knives, um, but, <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. But it sounds like it was a really fun film to conceptualize. I also wanted to have a question, uh, essentially not just conceptualizing, but what were fun things to do on set? So, like, what were your favorite scenes or favorite moments to like film? Yeah, I. It, it was it was kind of absurd, but. It was it was absurd for everyone involved to figure out the first couple of days we actually started cabling in the woods. We, we it was like we couldn't we we couldn't really figure it out at first because there were these huge like like we had we had built these carts and the cable was so unruly and we couldn't get it to like stay down on the ground and you know so really one of the one of the one of the like unique pleasures of this project was us figuring out like how to cable. On for, for for the movie, like how to get the cable to stay down, how to make it seem like there he actually could be like pulling a lot of it, and it wasn't all just like up in the air and like twisting around trees and stuff. So that just seeing like a team of people of us trying to like like just figure out the physics of how to cable was was <laughs> at first a huge frustration, and then became kind of a joy when we cracked it, you know. And we had all these crazy like methods of how to stake it down in certain places and someone would hold it at a certain distance. It was just crazy, you know, but, but that was, a, it was a huge joy. And that's kind of the, the absurd pleasure of making movies sometimes is, is finding yourself in the, the most unlikely of scenarios, having to figure something out, you know, like you're a caveman, like uh, you, you feel like given like this new task and then you do, and then you re and then you realize at some point in the edit that it, it feels like this world has actually been there for not for two days, but for a decade, maybe. Um, and then another fun element, I like the kids. The kids are really cool. The little like smash and grab kind of kids. Um, so I wanted to know like what influenced introducing those characters into the film? Yeah, I, I, uh, it, it was sort of like, um, I, you know, I'd actually read that book, um, the Nomadland book that-, that Oh, nice. I, I had read Nomadland before I made this movie and I had, you know, I had been thinking about and that book. I, I love the book. I'm so excited to see the movie, but I, I had been thinking about seasonal laborers just because of like this world. I was thinking like, what kind of people would be working in cabling? And I was thinking it was people like in Nomadland who maybe like drive around in RVs and find, you know, where the new, the hot zones are and whatever. So I was thinking of like, well, if they had kids, what would their kids be doing all day? And that's where the kids came from. Nice. 
Um, and then what do you ultimately want people to take from the film? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I, I think there's a pretty clear political message that um, isn't, you know, I, we, we've already talked about it a bit, but I think, you know, my biggest, my biggest like uh, challenge to the status quo, I think is, is like to knock down this idea of like rugged individualism and, um, and just this, this idea of, of the head start, I think is important for people to really take in and see, see Ray's journey and see how the, everyone has a little bit of Ray in them um, in the way that they sort of like take their head start for, for granted. And just to think about how they could, you know, what way in ways in which the, that head start could be helpful to, you know, larger social movements Great. than just themselves. That's really cool. I really, I really enjoyed Ray's turnabout, especially since he initially resisted the points, but then at the opportunity of like what that head start really got him, which was that really great route, um, he immediately was like, all right, let's buy everything. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ready, I'm into it. Cause like yeah. the promise of a better payday pushed him to engage with this privilege and then someone calling out. So I really, I really felt that when I was watching the film. And cool, all good, yeah. I thought it was extremely well done. I really liked the film. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and then, are there are there any other are there any pieces in the story that like got left in the cutting room floor that you wish that you got to explore more? Mm, that's a good question. There were there were a, a number of little moments that we had to cut out um, just for for kind of pacing and and moving things along and. Um, you know, there there were there was more backstory uh, in Queens with the brothers and stuff, but we didn't feel like we felt like we needed to get to the forest uh, as soon as we kind of could with this with this movie. That's where it really picks up. So, any more time lingering in Queens felt at a certain point unnecessary. Um, and there was, you know, there there were little encounters with strange characters in the woods here and there, but a lot of that got combined a bit into this like montage type sequence in the middle where that ends with the saxophone player all these people are like talking to him so there were there were fun um, ways in which you know it, challenges of, of compression became like a new type of sequence um well we are nearing the end of our time um so i just want to say thank you again for joining us for this q a and thank you so much for sharing your amazing film with us um it is absolutely great and the film does have distribution? Yes, um, yeah. we're, we're lucky we're working with Film Movement, really cool company, and they're gonna be doing a theatrical release, whatever is possible. It might, it might be virtual theatrical, probably, <laughs> but um, that's gonna be in, I think, February now. All right, so you've heard it here. Um, so if your friends don't get to see it at the Mill Valley Film Festival, definitely have them check out the film. It'll be released soon. And thank you again for watching and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone for watching and thank you Farida for the great questions and goodbye. <laughs>